Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening, everyone. My name is Michael Alcoholic. And uh, what a pleasure it is to be here tonight. I want to thank Larry. What a great host. Picked me up uh, the other night really late. And uh, thank you very much for the introduction as well. I want to thank Bob, Marnie, and the rest of the committee for offering me the opportunity to come out and share a little bit about what God has done for me in this thing we call Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, man, these speakers, uh, these friends of mine, how amazing are they? Listen, can we give them a run more round of applause? They've been great. Really been great. And I, gotta, I want to mention one other group of people, uh, and those are the tapers. Uh, these guys carry a great mission in Alcoholics Anonymous and uh, often overlooked. And just the AV people, I mean, if you can get this many chins on that small of a screen, these, this is talent. This is talent. I, uh, I came to Alcoholics Anonymous when I was 24 years old. I called you when I was 16 and when I was 18, and when I was 21, I put myself into treatment because I knew I needed help. And yet... It took me another three years to get sober. Now, I didn't join AA. I didn't quit. I wasn't a slipper. I never really got in. I was around it. I heard about it. I made a call. It didn't take, right? I mean, truly, like, there was a hotline number, and I called, and nothing happened after the call, right? Um, But when I got here when I was 24, there were some things that I heard that I didn't hear before that. On August 27th of 1991, I wanted to do whatever I could to be and to stay sober. And on August 26th, just the day before, I wanted to do whatever I could to be and stay loaded. I have no idea what happened that night. No idea how that motivation changed, that idea changed. I have no idea. Some sort of act of grace, perhaps. At least that's what we've been hearing from the other speakers this weekend. Likely that's true. Here's what I do know. When I came into Alcoholics Anonymous... About 90 days after hitting a bunch of meetings, I got transferred to a place called Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I was born and raised on the south side of Chicago. And uh, I didn't plan on being there very long. I'm still out there. And, uh, And the idea went like this. I'm supposed to move to Sioux Falls. I'm supposed to find a sponsor in a home group. I'm supposed to take a service commitment in that home group. And I'm supposed to find this guy who's going to walk me through the big book and work the steps. That's what I got at a place that I regularly attended meetings at in Chicago, a place called Lamont Oaks. And um, it was interesting because that was the plan. Uh, That was the idea. That was what I thought I was supposed to do. And so I started going to meetings, and I hated them. I hated them. I didn't like them at all. They were completely different than the ones in Chicago. Um, And I kept calling this guy Brian. Brian had 12-stepped me just a few weeks before this. And he said, just keep going to meetings, just keep going to meetings, just keep going to meetings. And so I did that. And while I was in those meetings, I heard this guy, and his name was Joe F***. It's a great name for an AA sponsor, by the way. And Joe, Joe F*** was so good at what he... He had this, like, uh, he had a great gift, and it was like wisdom to moron translator within him because at the end of meetings, when all of you would share everything that we call a wisdom, I didn't get any of it. Bounced off my forehead. And I would stand by this coffee pot, and Joe would translate for me what you said. And so I knew, I sort of felt, I sort of had this idea that Joe should probably be the one to be my sponsor. And so I asked him, and he said he didn't know if he would do that or not. That what we should do is sit down, have a cup of coffee, and that he would tell me his story, and that I would tell him mine, and at the end of that exchange, if we thought we could work together, he would sponsor me. And we did that. Went to this place called the Crack Pot. It's kind of ironic, but nonetheless, that was the name of the cafe. And we sat there, and we chain-smoked, and we chugged coffee, because you could do that back then. And... Uh, he told me a story. i got to be honest with you, I didn't hear a word of it. I heard none of it because I was writing my own as he was talking. And uh, as he began to describe what was wrong with him and finished his thing, he said, you go. And so I tried. I made my attempt to tell him my story. And he cut me off. Just, just a couple of minutes into that story, he cut me down. And he said, kid, you have no idea what alcoholism is, do you? Now, I've probably got 62 to 64 days at this time. Right? I kind of feel like I understand why I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. And so I said to him was, yes, I, understand. I know what alcoholism is. I know why I'm here. He said, why is that? I said, look, I was drunk all the time. I went into this big drop. He cut me off again. He said, look, you may not know this, but 
It's only been around a little while. It's okay. You're not supposed to know it. It's all right. But we have this thing called the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and in it there's this thing way at the beginning called the doctor's opinion. And Billy did a great job of describing that threefold malady or twofold malady, depending on what side of the aisle you're on, right? About what we, this thing we call alcoholism. And Joe went in to describe this allergy, and I got to tell you, it fit me hand in glove. You see, I don't know about anybody in this room, but I didn't come to Alcoholics Anonymous because I loved me, and it was time for me to grow up and change and, and grab onto life with a new start because I had really sabotaged all my gifts and I needed to find myself and, and self actualize. And re- That's not why I came. I came because I was tired of watching the people that I loved cry. Because for the last year and a half to two years, I got an awareness of what my life was doing to them and I didn't like it. I didn't come here because I love me. I didn't make a decision for my best interest. I wanted to stop hurting my mom and I wanted to stop hurting my sister. I swear to God, that's why I came. Joe went on to describe this other part of the ailment when he got through finished uh, discussing the allergy. And it was this mind. And Dr. Silkworth says that we have an inability to differentiate the true from the false. And, and that means the true things look false to Mike Donnelly and false things look true to Mike Donnelly. And so you can say things that are accurate to me and I'm going to hear them wrongly. You know? And he said, Mike, again, you probably don't know this by now. It's our second or third conversation. It might be day 70 or so. He said, we have this chapter, chapter three. It's called More About Alcoholism. And in there it describes the thoughts that precede the first drink. He said, Mike, I got some good news and some bad news for you. First of all, let me ask you a question. Do you think you have this allergy? I had heard enough about it and read about it. Said, yeah, man, I got that thing. Good. He said, how about this lie in mind? How about this inability to differentiate true from the false? You think you got that? I, said, I think I got that. Good. I just want to tell you, we don't do anything about either one of those two things here. So I'm glad that you have the allergy. See, we're not doctors, Mike. We can't fix your body. And contrary to popular belief, I'm sure, although not in this room, I can just tell you, we are not psychiatrists, psychologists, therapists, counselors. That's not what we do here. And I was like, well, look, if we don't work on the allergy and we don't work on the body or the mind, what do we do here? He said, we only work on the third part. And I said, what's that? And he said, that's your broken soul. I'm like, that's the part of you that has felt separate from God and from the rest of humanity your whole life. That's the part that ached so bad you were willing to shove God-awful things into it to try to get some level of satisfaction so that you could just feel a little bit better. He said, Mike, do you have a broken soul? i got to tell you, it scared me. It scared me. What he was doing, and I didn't know, is he was qualifying me. You see, what Joe was doing, he wasn't necessarily worried about me taking step one or he didn't get a free set of steak knives if he brought yet another newcomer to a meeting. Like That's not what was going on. He was working his 12th step. And the way Joe understood the 12th step was that no matter if I stayed in Alcoholics Anonymous or I left Alcoholics Anonymous, that I would understand what alcoholism is and that there's a solution for it. He was more concerned about presenting that to me than whether or not I stayed. He wanted me to stay if I had it. But he wasn't going to try to guilt me into just coming back because I'm supposed to come back because he's my sponsor and it would look bad if he didn't come back. You know, I'm so glad I met a guy like that. Because he let me take that information and throw it up against myself and ask myself, does my behavior reflect the fact of what alcoholics always have, which is a bodily allergy and an obsession of the mind? And it did. And it did. So he went on to talk to me about step two a little bit. And uh, what he encouraged me to do is listen to CDs, talk to people, listen to meetings, to read those stories in the back of the book, to read those stories that are salt and peppered throughout the big book, right? So that I could be exposed to some new ideas so that perhaps I could come to believe that a power greater than myself could do exactly for me what it had done for all of you, restore me to sanity. And I did that. And that wasn't a big jump for me. I was raised in the church. My mom and dad were um, very faithful people, very good people. There was nothing really new that, um, that I was hearing from Joe that I hadn't heard a thousand times before. Yeah, I believed. Sure, I believed, right? So we made this decision together. 
We got on our hands and knees and we said this third step prayer. And while we were down there after we finished that prayer, he said, look, I don't want you to think for a second you just took the third step. What you did was you said a prayer. And and that prayer voiced your willingness to work 4 through 12. And it'll be that process that brings about a spiritual awakening. And that spiritual awakening and the God that you find in the midst of that, he'll be your solution to your alcoholism. Not you, not your toughness, not your home group, although that's wonderful stuff. It's great stuff. But it's got to be him, and it's got to center on him, and it's got to always be a growing relationship with him. He would just said it. I mean, he just he wasn't candy-coating it. He wasn't pretending to be anything other than exactly what he was. He just said it out loud. He didn't really care how it fell on me. And so we started out on this journey. We heard about this journey all weekend, right? He told me that what was more important than whether I said the third step prayer was whether I would fulfill the decision in step three by working four through 12. And I tried as best I could. I made a ton of mistakes along the way. And I'm going to give you a little quick synopsis of what that looked like until we expand out on step eight and nine. And the first thing he did is he handed me a piece of paper and a pen and he told me to write down my resentments, my fears, and my sex conduct. Make these check marks, say these prayers. And again, as best I could, as likely as imperfect as it was, I did the best I could. And I went through that process and I went to this priest because he told me to go to a priest because I was raised Catholic. And I sat with that guy for six hours and I told him everything I had written down. And then we came out of there and he sent me home and I had this little paragraph on page 75 I was supposed to take a peek at, right? Sit there for about an hour and thank God from the bottom of my heart that I know him better. Ask myself these questions, right? Stones properly in place if I tried to make mortar without sand. And I think, I think, I don't know for sure, but I think, the real, the real focus of those questions are, Mike, are you being serious? Are you being sincere? Are you, are you trying to be honest here? And I, honestly, to the best of my knowledge, I was as stunned as anyone else. I think the answer was yes. And that stunned me because I know I was a con. I knew it. And for some reason, all of your stories and the way you lived your lives right out in front of me was so attractive to me that I, I think watching all of you And watching all of your example gave me an opportunity to be sincere, maybe for the first time in my life, about this problem. So, we went to page 76, and we said these prayers, and we moved on, and we get to step eight. And this is part of my little deal here this weekend that I get to chat about. In step eight, the first thing I did was I transferred the names on my four-step onto another piece of paper. And Joe said, Look, if you run across additional things as you're writing those down, additional names, maybe people you've heard, I want you to put those down too. You don't have to write a whole other four-step on there. But if something triggers as you're transferring them over, I just want you to put the names down. And I did that. There were kids in school. There was family members, obviously. There was, man, all kinds of creditors on there, right? There was government entities, you know, because they're all out to get us. I don't know if anybody's mentioned that tonight. It's a topic we've overlooked dreadfully, right? I mean, I just had these crazy thoughts. And I'd put something down, and that would spawn four or five more thoughts, and I'd write those down. And I got this thing called an A-step. And it was, it was stunning to me. I, really, I couldn't believe I was, like, at step eight. Like, I was really happy that I was at step eight. And Joe told me to start praying for the willingness to make amends. And I know that there's some different ideas on that. You know, there's a column that I will make and the column that I might make and a column that I'm never going to make. Like, oh, that's cool. That's that's fun. It's personal preference. No problem with any of that. Joe just said, just pray. Just keep praying. He prayed for a couple of weeks and he said, okay, let's get going. I said, "I, I don't think I'm willing yet, you know. And we had a little conversation about the difference between willing to and wanting to. Right? You see, I really believed that willingness was a feeling. That willingness was something that like, now now I want to. I want, I'm so happy I get to. No, that's not necessarily it. Willingness perhaps is doing it in spite of whether I want to or not. Doing it in spite of the thoughts that run through my head that tell me I shouldn't, I couldn't, I better not. You better be very careful when you do this one. If she finds out about that, you're in All that noise... All those things that block me from just going and doing it? I think willingness is doing it in spite of those thoughts. Right? Under the guidance of a sponsor, for sure. 
And I did that. I started that. And uh, I remember I was in this meeting. I started going to meetings on step nine to like listen how other people had done it because you know, that's just what you do where I come from in AA, right? If you're in, gonna, getting ready to do step nine, you go to a bunch of step nine meetings. And I heard this person, and what she had done was she was walking through the mall in Sioux Falls, and, and this kid that she had gone to grammar school with had walked by her. And she just, man, she just knew it was divine providence. And so she ran up to her, and she had treated her still less than lovingly in grammar school, and she made the amends, and she was in awe. And I thought, that, that, that must be how this gets done, is you just sort of sit back and wait for God to ordain all this stuff, Right? Now, as I mentioned, I'm from Chicago, so I went to Joe, and he said, hey, how did that meeting go? I said, great. I said, this is going to be awesome. This is going to be awesome. I, am, I, am, I have given this to God, and he will, he will orchestrate the outcome. He said, do you really think that everyone that you offended in Chicago is somehow going to be on a big bus trip going out to see the Black Hills in Rapid City and suddenly stop in the mall in Sioux Falls, and you're just going to meet them all at one time and just randomly stand there, and I apologize, here's the check I owe you, here's what I it's not going to happen, Mike. I have a different idea. On Friday, when you're off work, I want you to drive to Chicago. And I want you to make amends all day Saturday and all day Sunday. And I want you to leave somewhere around noon on Sunday because you've got a nine-hour drive back to Sioux Falls because you have to be at work on time Monday morning. I had that for months. And I made amends to people I had hurt in school. I made amends to family members. And i got to tell you, the first run there and back was terrible. It was absolutely awful. Like, I hated it. I cursed him all the way to Chicago and all the way back. The second trip was a little different, though. I felt a little bit better about me. I felt like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of doing this. I'm kind of like a member of AA. I'm kind of like really doing it, you know? And on the third trip back, I couldn't wait for the next weekend to get back again and do it again. You see, I don't know how you see these two steps, but here's how I see them. I see them as the culmination of the first phase of our recovery. And I think, I don't know, I don't know, I'm not a professional, right? I'm just a jamoke from south side of Chicago. But the way it was explained to me and the way it seems to have, been, have unfolded in my life is this. There's a process, and it's called four through nine. And in four through nine, I have an experience that when I have the experience, you can't talk me out of the fact I had that experience, and it's mine. And then it begins to radically change everything I think of. It changes the way I look at resentments. It changes the way I look at fear. It changes the way I looked at my sex, sex conduct. And you can't talk me out of the fact it didn't happen, because it really happened, and it really happened to me. And here's how it really happened. I wrote some stuff down. I told somebody. I said some prayers. I made a list, and I went out and made amends and restitution for the wrongs I had done. Perfectly? Nope. Wrong guy if you're looking for perfect, right? But the truth is, there were some things that radically changed the way I viewed this. And the first, believe it or not, the thing that helped me in step nine were the fifth step promises. See, I, I didn't know that I was going to need those promises to help carry me through to step nine. I didn't know that. This idea that I was walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe, that I could look the world in the eye, I don't know about you, but step nine would have been really hard for me if I didn't experience the fifth step promises. You know, I just want to chat for a little while about some of those experiences that I had in step nine and, and talk a little bit about what they sort of mean to me today. And, you know, as I, as I think about them, they, they centered around a lot of different things. The first is money. That's an easy one to talk about, right? And I got to tell you, I had like thirty, forty thousand dollars worth of credit card debt, and it, none of it was cool stuff. It was all stupid stuff. It was all like pizza, beer, and late fees. That's what the thirty grand was. I'm dead serious. I'm dead serious. It was nothing. There was no big screen TV, right? There was no trip to Vegas, right? There was none of that. It was junk. It was junk. And year after year after year after year, gone. Gone. I didn't file federal income tax for three years prior to joining Alcoholics Anonymous or Illinois state tax. <laughs> Whoops. And uh, they tend to frown on that kind of thing. I don't know. How do you make amends for that? How do you, how do you go to the IRS and go, I, I just didn't do it? I just didn't do it. Well, I don't know how you're supposed to do it, but I can tell you how I did it. I found an accountant in the program. He was a buddy of my sponsors. And he sat me down, and we went through all the paperwork, and we got all the paperwork together and did it correctly. 
and honestly. And then he wrote some letter that accountants write, I guess, and he had me sign it, and I signed it. And for three and a half years, every single month, I paid the IRS back the money that I owed them. And i got to tell you, there was only two checks I ever wanted to send, man. I'm dead serious. The first one, so I could brag to Joe that I was doing it, and of course, the last one, right? But i got to tell you, in between there, every single month, there was some reason why it wasn't going to work this time. The money just wasn't good. There wasn't going to be enough at the end of the month. Look, I can't do this to my landlord. That would be unspiritual to not pay my rent. I had all these reasons and excuses as to why this particular month it wasn't going to work. And I got to tell you, every time that check hit the mailbox, somehow it worked. Somehow it worked. No matter how much was left at the end, it always worked. But it was about consistency. Just keep doing it. Just Just keep doing it. And I'd get this noise in my head. And I'm not going to jump ahead of the other steps, but i got to tell you, the noise in my head about how it wasn't going to work got handled very beautifully by 10, 11, and 12. And we'll let other folks handle that. But when that noise would come up and that would well up, like I had no idea that was part of my alcoholism. I had no idea that me talking me out of making amends to the people that deserve justice from the wrongs I had done to them was part of my alcoholism. I didn't even look at it that way. Early in my recovery, I thought my only lie really is about booze. It's not. It's about all kinds of things. That was just one of them. My dad was absolutely my hero. I, mean, I got his cufflink. I'm, I'm not a jewelry guy, right? Ralph and I were chatting just before the meeting. I, I, got, my, I got my dad's cufflinks and his, and his tie pin on here. My dad was absolutely and still to this day my hero. That guy was amazing. Now, some of you didn't have that, and I'm sorry, but I had it. And I'm so happy I did. This guy could walk into a room and, like, everybody would turn and look at him. He could tell a story like nobody's business. He was a police lieutenant in the city of Chicago. He led men everywhere. He served multiple tours of duty in Korea. And he loved my mom openly right in front of my sister and I. He didn't care what you thought about it either. He was a man of integrity and honor. And when I was six years old, he went off to work one day like he did every single day. And he didn't come home on time like he did every single day. You could imagine, a police lieutenant in Chicago, there might be a little need for overtime. This particular day was different. An artery had broken in his bowel, and they raced him off to the hospital. And he sat there and hemorrhaged for 10 days uh, in Michael Reese Hospital on the south side of Chicago. And that's when the Lord took him home. And I was six I just turned six and my sister was eight. And I looked up to this man and I didn't know how to talk about it and I didn't know what to say even if I could talk about it, but I didn't have language to express it. And I remember at his funeral, all the people coming up to me, patting me on the head, saying, you're the man of the family now. Like, they were just being people, right? But like, I believed it. Like, I'm supposed to do, I'm supposed to know what to do now. I'm absolutely supposed to know what to do now. And I didn't know what ever to do. I never knew what to do. I'm not exactly sure I know what to do today. I know what not to do today. I, knew, I know who to call when I absolutely am out of answers. Right? But I remember thinking to myself when I was 12 years old and that booze thing came around. Right? I got some relief from that. And I had no idea that I had an allergy to alcohol at 12 years old. Who knows that? I didn't know that. I didn't even know at 24 when I got sober that I had it until that conversation with Joe at the crackpot. But my dad and losing him and not having him around caused all kinds of things for me. That, you know, just people have, man. This is life. This is real life. It's real life. Right? So everybody's got a different hand. That's the one that was dealt me. Like, big deal. Right? But I idolized this guy. And when you did the things that I did, and you idol, and your hero is a guy who honored your mother, and I used to break into her front room window and steal money out of her purse and booze out of her fridge, and would get right up next to her face this far from it and scream obscenities into her face with my finger right near her nose. Man, I was ashamed of myself. I was ashamed of myself. 
So I said to Joe, I don't know how to make this amend, which is a good question if you don't have a good sponsor. That you, if you don't have a sponsor, you should get one, and, and because that's a question that you might need an answer to. It's a question that I needed an answer to. I didn't know how to do that. So he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to write a letter, and I want you to go to your dad's grave site, and I want you to go read it to your dad. And I did that. And I'm not really sure what happened. Um, as a matter of fact, I know, I know what I said. I apologized for my life. I apologized for the way I treated my mother and my sister. I apologized for the ruckus that I had caused my family. How he tried to live an honorable life. And how I took that honor and kind of trashed it. I remember saying all that stuff. I was out there probably 20, 25 minutes at that gravesite reading this letter to my dad. Sometimes I cried, sometimes I didn't. I remember, I remember feeling when the, when the tears were well enough that I should stop that. And I, and, I, and I would try to make myself stop it. But after reading that letter, I stood there. And it was just quiet. And seemingly nothing happened. The sky didn't open, right? Jesus didn't come down. Like, nothing happened, right? But i got to tell you, I walked away from that grave knowing that if my dad could help me, he would. Now, I don't know how the economy of the afterlife works. I don't know how heaven works. I don't know how those things operate. But i got to tell you, I was probably nine months sober when I wrote and stood in front of my dad's grave and read that letter. And there have been times in my recovery, times in my life, times where I know that I wanted my dad around. I needed that help. I can't prove it to you at all. But I know he was there. How do I know that? I don't know. I don't know how I know. I just know. See, that's part of my experience. That may not be yours, but that's part of mine. And I did the work because I had a good sponsor who walked me through that book, and now nobody can take that away from me. That's mine. I know that God is with me from things like that. Right? And it isn't because I'm good, because I got news for you, right? I ain't good, right? I'm trying really hard, but I'm good as I'm really far from good. But I'm trying. And that was a big moment for me. And I, and I remember I needed to go and make amends to my mom after that. And I went to Joe and I said, you know, I don't know. How, how do you make amends for that stuff? Like, I don't, I don't know how to do it. And he said, all I want you to do is talk to her. And so I went home and I talked to her. And I came back to Sioux Falls again. And I said, it just wasn't enough. Like, it's not enough. And he said, well, when are you going back? I said, Thanksgiving. He said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to give her a hug. I said, well, you don't really understand. My mom and I don't hug. He said, well, I don't sponsor your mother, and I'm not asking her to hug you. I sponsor you, and I'm telling you to hug your mother. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. So I went home at Thanksgiving, and I put my arms around my mom, and she did this. She got really nervous. It's kind of a weird feeling, right? So I went back at Christmas. He said, do the same thing. I did the same thing. I went back at St. Patrick's Day expecting the same thing. See, I can show you. You can come to my mom's house where she lived on the south side of Chicago. And if you walk right in the front door, you go about four steps in and there's a hallway to your right. And down that hallway is all of the bedrooms that we grew up in. Right where those two hallways meet is the, is the place for the first time in years where the hands of my mom came up behind my back and pulled her son into herself. And my ideas about Alcoholics Anonymous were revolutionized. That's a good word, Jennifer. Right? Completely changed. You see, I came here because I was convinced that I needed to quit drinking, and I was right. And I was pretty convinced, given the results that all of you had done, that I had seen at conferences and seen in meetings, that it worked. But I think today, and I learned that moment in that hallway that sobriety was the least important gift you were going to give me. Now, without that, I wouldn't get anything else, so i got to have that or I don't get anything else. But it might, be, it might be the smallest one, super important, no disrespect at all. But see, I became a son that afternoon. I came to AA to be sober, and you allowed me an opportunity if I would do the work to become a son. Wow way beyond not drinking. Way beyond not drinking. 
And I said to Joe, I'm like, this happened. And I was telling him, like, I was excited. And he's like, good. He's like, that's the beginning. Here's how we're going to do this from here forward, right? I want you to call your mother every week. And I want you to ask her two questions. He said, the first question is, hey, mom, how was your week? And the second question, no matter what she says, is this. Wow, that sounds interesting. Could you tell me more about that? He goes, but don't be surprised if, like, you know, some moment in the hallway, like, there's going to be moments where it's going to be tough. And I'm like, my mom and I don't really do that. And he goes, I don't sponsor your mother. I sponsor you, and I'm telling you to call and ask these questions. And I started doing that, and Joe was right. He was absolutely right. The first few questions, the first few weeks, you see, my mom, and rightly so, still believed I was the guy who was breaking into her front room window just months before this to steal money out of her purse. Why would she think anything different? Why? So the deal went like this. Hey, Mom, how was your week? Fine. Wow, that sounds interesting. Could you tell me more about that? (laughs) Really fine. Okay, talk to you next week. That was about it. And that was it for like the first month or so. But you know, something really odd happened. The the answers began to get longer. The answers to the questions got longer. Well, you know, Kitty picked me up and we went to Mass. And, you know, I got to take Cleo to the vet, right? And those, those folks at the hospice place I work at, you know, that Aunt Sally, that old lady I was telling you about last week, she passed away and her family came. And so I got to tell you, I'm really a cool guy. Like, that is lame. That is completely a lame life, right? Well, it's not. It's a beautiful life. And my mom began to share her really beautiful life with me in very short telephone conversations. And you think that's weird? I got to tell you something that's even weirder. Uh, I began to actually care about the answers. Right before my eyes, I changed. Right before my eyes, I changed. Hey, Ma, how's Cleo doing? Oh, wait, that's not in the script. Hey, Mom, how was your week? Back to the script. Like, all of a sudden, like, out of nowhere, this, a relationship began to blossom where there was none before. And it became very natural and very open. And my mom and I carried that conversation on for years in Alcoholics Anonymous. I got a call one day. My sister said, hey, Mike, uh, I have to go out of town to work. Mom, uh, I don't know, they put mom in the hospital for something on her stomach, and I'm not exactly sure what it is. And she's supposed to go to this funeral and blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, I'll come in and, uh, and see what it is. It just didn't sit right with me. So I went in and uh, I went to this funeral for my mom. And uh, the doctor comes out and he says, we're going to do some exp- exploratory surgery on your mom, which I didn't even know they do exploratory surgery anymore. I was like, is a Marcus Welby episode? What's going on with this? Isn't there some sort of, like, can't you tell? What? I mean, it was weird. But that's what they did. And he comes out and he says, your mom has cancer everywhere. And it's likely ovarian and it's likely taken her life. I don't know if she'll die in two months from this or two years from this. I don't know. But this is really bad. And it's going to take your mom. And he stood up and he walked away from me. And I waited for her to get out of her, you know, recovery area or whatever. And I went in and talked to my mom. And every weekend I came home. I live in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, uh, South Dakota as I said. And uh, my mom was in Chicago. And so I drive back every weekend to be with my mom in hospice. And my mom had such a great sense of humor. Like my mom was just, just the perfect Irish Catholic mother. She was just fantastic. She smokes Vantage 100s. And they're like the longest cigarette in the history of cigarettes, man. They are huge things. And she was a professional, smoke, professional smoker. She had like two puffs of those back. They were gone, man. It was great. Just... <laughs> My kind of lady, you know? And then she'd get mad at you, and she would be like, you know, I've told you 50 times. And you'd be like, she, but you wouldn't exhale the smoke out? So she'd be like, you know, jumping on you for being a moron, and like smoke would be like oozing out of her complaints about you. It was great. It was great. So she happened to be in on my 40th birthday, and this is just to show you the wit of my mother. Now, this is after a long period of 
reconstruction, as they say, with this relationship. And I, I walk in and I go, uh, it was my birthday, it was my 40th birthday. I walked in and I said, hey, Ma, guess what today is? She just gives me the look, you know. And I said, it's the 40th anniversary of the happiest day of your life, okay? She goes, oh, shit. Moves around like this. My mom had this great wit about her, you know. So I'm traveling in Indianapolis one day, and I said, uh, it just hit me. Ask your mom about eight and nine. Ask your mom about eight and nine. So I called my mom, and I said, uh, hey, Ma, you know, in Alcoholics Anonymous, we have this thing called Steps 8 and 9. You remember when we had our conversation? Yeah, I do. I said, well, look, you know, um, look, we're Catholic people. We talked very openly about her death and what all that might or might not take place. And I said, look, you're going home soon. Right? Is, is there something that you feel like you need rectified? And I know you're bedridden and you can't make that. And it would be a great honor if there is something pinging on your conscience and you need it cleaned up. I'd be honored to do that for you. No, no, I think I'm all right. Okay. No problem. Talked about other things and moved on. The very next day I called her, as I always did. And she said, hey, I've been thinking about that thing you said. Oh, yeah? Yeah. She said, when you come in, there might be a couple of things I'd like you to do for me. Oh, my gosh. Sure, Mom. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll see you Friday. Yeah. Man, I drove like a maniac down I-90 to get there. And I walked into her hospice room, and, and my mom had torn off a little corner of a magazine, and there were two names on it. Two names. My mom lived 68 years on the planet. There were two names on her eighth step. <laughs> my eighth step looked like a roll of bounty paper towel that had just like rolled out. It was like roll forever, right? Two names. And I had the honor of driving around the south side of Chicago to try to find these people. And I found both of them. And I got to very humbly yet very proudly say, my name is Michael Donnelly. And Anne-Marie Donnelly wants to make this right. Will you forgive her? Both of them said, yeah. We worked out whatever needed to be worked out, which is between my mom and her God. Very small stuff, gang. Very small stuff. But I got to tell you, I didn't touch the ground, man. I was about 20 feet off the ground on the way home. I didn't think I could get happier. I swear to you, I didn't. And then I walked in and I handed her that little corner from that magazine with both names crossed off, and I realized I could get happier. Seeing my mom's face change... It's one of the greatest gifts Alcoholics Anonymous ever gave me, and it has absolutely zero to do with booze. Zero. Now, I, I wouldn't have seen that if we didn't get sober and stay that way, right? But man, I got to tell you, that's a far cry from just staying sober. You see, for me, step eight and nine is where the magic absolutely takes off. It's where the rocket fuel gets ignited. And the life that God has always planned for us becomes lunging at us. It just lunges at us. Freedom, 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 freedom. All these different places, all these different spots, all these different parts of our life that we get so bent over with the weight of gets taken off our shoulders in 8 and 9. I didn't know that. But now I've experienced it. And there isn't anybody who can talk me out of the fact that that's true. Because I've experienced it. Not because I heard a speaker talk about it, although I have. Not because Joe did it and he told me about it because he did. But because I had a sponsor who would not settle for me just showing up at meetings, making sure I didn't drink, maybe driving a guy to a meeting here and there. He wanted me to be a step-working member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And although I didn't understand it at the time, Joe Friday understood it in that booth. And he wanted to make sure that day that I understood what alcoholism was and that there was a solution for it. So i got to tell you, there's a few others uh, that have impacted me a lot. One was uh, some of my selfish behavior with women. Um, I didn't always look this way. At, at one point, I was kind of a good-looking guy. And uh, <laughs> full head of hair, one chin, 
Totally different face. Totally different face. But the point was, I was very selfish out there. And I needed to go to these ladies and I needed to look them in the eye and I needed to say, I'm sorry. Right? But more than that, Joe taught me, and it's through the big book, right? Page 77 all the way to, to 83. It's salt and pepper through the big book. There are four parts to an amend, as I've been taught, as I can find in the big book. The first is an act of confession. And that's where I go to the person and I confess what I did wrong. The second is an act of contrition. And that's during that conversation, I express my regret. Not just an apology, but my regret for what I have done. The third is an act of restitution. Right? I gotta pay back what I took. And then the fourth is an act of repentance. I gotta stop doing it. I gotta stop doing it. And it only makes sense. Like if I stole 20 bucks from you and I went to you and I said, hey man, I'm really sorry about that. And you're like, well, okay, I guess you're forgiven. And you just sort of walk away. You're like, no, no, give me the 20, right? And if I give you the 20 back and then the next time you leave the room, I steal another 20 from you, I'm not sure that's exactly what they're talking about here. Four parts. Four parts. So i got to tell you, in a room this size, there are likely, just likely law of averages, there's probably some ladies who have been hurt by selfish guys. So on behalf of selfish men everywhere, I'm dreadfully sorry that that happened to you. My regret in that is that it altered the way I looked at people. It altered the way I looked at relationships. Right? People became objects for me to use on my chessboard. If I can get these two pieces in the right spot, then I can win the game. People became objects to me. That's not how it's supposed to be. Making amends for some of the selfish behavior I had in relationships altered and changed the way I looked at people. And again, you couldn't have told me that before doing it, but that's exactly what happens. And I can tell you that although none of you may find a great deal in that, my wife sure does today. Because what's weird and what's interesting is when I get new glasses, as Chuck C. talked about, I can't take them off. They're like, the one part he doesn't talk about is how they get glued on your face. You <laughs> Once you see different, you can't go back and see what, unsee what you see now. At least I can't, or haven't been able to yet. I hope I never can. I hope I never can. There's a couple of stories, uh, that really were impactful for me when it comes to this. One was my mom, of course. But another was about this guy. His name was Joe. And Joe was a customer of mine. And I don't know about you guys, but uh, I'm a salesman. And when I'm in a sales contest, I don't want to win. I got to win, right? I mean, I got to win. And I'm willing to break or bend any rules possible because that is what matters, right? Winning is what matters. So I had this customer, and I went to him, and I was selling some stuff. And uh, I falsified a contract for the company that I was working for so that they would have to buy more from me so that my average dollars could go up so that I could win the contest. That's just capitalism. And uh, it's not capitalism. That's not capital. I'm just kidding, right? But I mean, that's how I thought. That's exactly how I thought. And so I went to this customer and I did that. I falsified these contracts and I got him to buy more than he needed to so that my average could raise. I took second in the contest anyway. Second place, we all know, is first place among all of the losers, right? We know that, right? So, <laughs> so he's on my A step. And I go to my sponsor and I say, I don't know what to do about this. And he said, yes, you do. We've been through enough of these. He said, but before we go anywhere, he says, I need you to really think about this because you're missing something here. And I said, what's that? And he said, you falsified company documents and you only have your customer on your eighth step. You have to go to your boss and tell your boss that you falsified company documents to make sure that you did this or that you won this contest. Can I just quit? Can I just quit and uh, mail a check to the guy? And No, 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 no. Okay. So I went to my boss and I told her what I had done. And she said to me, um, well, look, it, at renewal time, why don't, we just, why don't we just give them like a discount on what the overage was between A and B. And that way he'll get his money back. 
And that way, you know, we can just move on and our company won't be damaged in reputation and we can just move forward. And the first thought was, that woman is brilliant, you know? And I said, no, I can't do that. I got to go to him and I got to tell the truth. And uh, I did that. She said, well, if you do that and he tries to sue or he gets into big trouble like this is on you, you and I never had the conversation. You're on your own. Okay. So I went to Joe and I said, look, uh, do you have a few minutes? I really need to sit down and chat with you. And I went over there and uh, sat down in his office. He called me in and, and I said, Joe, I, uh, I need to talk to you. And he goes, are you okay, man? You're a little sweaty, you know? And I'm like, well, I'm a little nervous, but everything's okay. Anyways, what I wanted to talk to you about, I'm just you know, panicked, man. I was panicked, right? Because i got to tell you, I knew the outcome. right? I am not correlating 10, 11, and 12 getting my mind right and my heart and soul right with step nine right now. Not in that office that day, I wasn't. I was given all the tools to calm me down, but I didn't exercise any of them. I was just panicked. My head is lying to me about outcomes, man. And I, uh, I said, well, here, look, here's the deal. Here's the deal. So... Last year when you bought this from me, I falsified company documents because I wanted to win a sales contest. And, uh, and I lied to you, and, I, and the difference is $750. Now, this was 1991, and that may not have been a lot of money to any of you in 1991, but it was an enormous amount of money to me in 1991. As I said, I owed the IRS, and I owed credit card companies, and I owed everybody and their brother. And I don't have it, by the way. I don't have the $750. I have $250 today, which I'll gladly give to you. And in six weeks, I get another commission check, and I'll bring back, and you can have the other $500, and we can be square. And he goes, hmm, why are you here? And I was like, well, I stole $750 from you. I went through the whole thing again. And he said, no, 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 I got, I got all I got all that. I got all that. Why are you doing this? Why are you coming here and telling on yourself? Why are you doing this? And I started to cry a little bit. And I, like, never cried because I'm pretty cool, right? <laughs> I'm a guy. I'm from the south side of Chicago. We don't, we don't do that stuff, right? So I thought. And I said, Joe, I've messed my life up, man. I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous and I'm trying to make things right and I have completely, completely destroyed my life. And so look, these guys there, they tell me if I do this stuff that somehow God will show up and somehow He'll fix my life and sort of believe it, but I'm not really sure, but I'm here anyways because I know i got to do it. And he goes, can I tell you a story? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> you know. So he, he starts telling me this story. And he said, when I was a little kid, my brother and I used to go down to this place called Cherry Creek Farms. I have no idea where Cherry Creek Farms is. No idea. But they used to be pea pickers. And apparently, from what Joe said, they had this basket on their, on their side. And they would pick these peas, and they would sort of almost get unconscious with pea picking. Right? It would just sort of like take over, and they would just sort of zone out and trance out. And they would just, you know. And they filled up these baskets. And if they filled up these baskets to a certain line, the farmer gave them a quarter. And if they didn't fill it up to the basket, they didn't get a quarter for that basket. And you had to stay in the row so that the farmer knew which rows were picked. And there were two bells that rang, one with 15 minutes left to pick and one when you just absolutely needed to be in the pickup truck because it was a long walk back to the farmhouse. So it's like this one day, Mike, I'm out there and I'm picking these peas and I'm picking these peas and I'm picking I'm totally unconscious about it and I'm just rocking and rolling, man. I am cruising. I am, I am just busting it up. He said, I heard this train come by out in the field. And I saw this cowboy, this like hobo guy, jumps off the train and he had a big 10-gallon hat on. And I saw him sort of roll. And then I didn't even think about him anymore. And I started going back, blah, 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 pick peas, right? And he says, uh, the first bell rang. And I kind of out of the corner of my eye saw this guy. And he had his hat off. And he was picking peas, and he was putting them into his hat, and he was in my row. And I got completely distracted. I could not refocus. And I thought, this guy is stealing my peas, right? 
And he's doing this, and he's doing this, and he said, no matter what I did, I couldn't get back, and I'm, I'm just so angry at him, and I'm focused on him, and I'm angry at him, and I'm focused on him, and I can't get back to where I was. And I know I'm not going to fill the basket up, and I hear that first bell ring. And I'm ticked, and I start walking in, going over to the road, make sure I'm in the pickup truck, and I hear, hey, kid! Joe says he turns around, and there's this guy standing there with his hat. And he says, Mikey walks up to me and he dumps this hat into my basket and it fills it up to the line. I'm going to get my quarter. And he pokes me in the chest and he says, remember that kid? Somebody gave you a hat full of peas one day and you didn't even ask for it, but you got one anyway. And someday somebody's going to come knocking on your door and they're going to need you a hat full of peas. And you better give them one, kid, because somebody gave you one once. He says, do you know what I mean, Mike? And I was like, no, I, I don't. Peas? I, no idea. He said, Mike, I don't want your money. You can come here every day if you want and drop off checks all day long. I'm never cashing them. Ready for this? He said, the honesty in your eye is payback enough. Wait, no, I didn't. I, I was the thief. Maybe honesty and thief. I'm not sure how they meet, but I'm tell, I was the thief. No, this is God's world, not Mike's world. And only in God's world can a thief become honest. That's the only place, man. I don't know of anywhere else. He said, by the way, if you ever need a job, I want you to come looking for me. We could use an honest guy like you. Wow. Blew me away. Because that's not the script I had written. That's not the story. That's not the outcome that was supposed to take place at all. And then he says... Maybe you don't want to be in our business. That's fine. He says, uh, but I'll tell you what. If you need a letter of recommendation, you call my secretary, and I'll have her write one for you. And she'll just bring it in. I'll sign it. You can pick it up at the front desk. Because that's not supposed to happen. He's supposed to call my boss and complain and talk about legal action and all the rest of the stuff, and I'm supposed to lose my job. And then he's supposed to go to the local chamber of commerce, Right? and make sure that no one hires me ever again in a small town like Sioux Falls, South Dakota. That's exactly how that script is written. And none of it took place. Zero. And then he says, but remember something, Mike. And I said, what's that? And he said, somebody gave you a hat full of peas. And someday, Mike, somebody's going to come knocking on your door and they're going to need a hat full of peas and you better give them one because somebody gave you one once. Guys, this whole program is a hat full of peas. It looks like we're here for sobriety. And we are. And we are. For sure. But that's not it. That's not the whole thing. You see, what I've learned about Alcoholics Anonymous is that sobriety is the starting line. It's not the finish line. It's where the party begins, not where it ends. If I will do the work and I will let God take me to the places that He desires me to go, I can have all that he wants from me if I'll just receive it, if I'll just let him love me. i got to tell you, to me, that's the crux of step nine. You see, I have these forecasts, I have all these images in my head of forecasting about how all this crap is going to turn out. It's going to be bad. I don't mean bad, I mean really bad. And I'm wrong every time. The book says nine times out of ten the unexpected happens. i got to tell you, I think Bill undershot nine out of ten. It's more like 99 Point nine 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 out of a hundred. Sure, there's a handful of things that we hear about, for sure. And God bless those folks. But the vast majority, under the guidance of a sponsor, just like every other fear and every other worry that I wrote down on my four-step, it's false. At least that's what I've come to see. At least that's how my experience has been. The men that I sponsor that do this, I have one gentleman, he's a three-time convicted felon. He should be in prison forever. Some of you know my buddy Reed. He walks a free man today, never asked, never once asked, never filed a piece of paper to get a stay. He walks a free man today. It's kind of cool. I've seen marriages put back together. I've seen broken hearts healed up because of this process that would have never, ever been healed any other way. I, I can't prove that to you. 
I can just do what we always do in Alcoholics Anonymous, and that's come and tell you a story about me. In the hopes that you believe the story so that you pick up the book and do the work too, and then you can have a story, and then you can tell it to the next guy. Because this whole thing is about the next guy. That stuff happened to me, and it changed my life, and I'll be forever grateful. I came here to not drink, and God made me a son right before my eyes. He made me an honest employee right before my eyes. He made me a man without debt right before my eyes. On and on and on and on. A man that my wife can trust. You know, my wife and I went through a hard time about the first five years of our marriage. Maybe some of you have been in that little trickery, you know? And I used to pray, please, God, don't let me get divorced. Please, God, please, God, please, God. Somewhere around five years, the prayer changed. I don't, I don't know how. I don't even know why it just began to change. I think it's because of this process of four through nine that's repeated chronically over in 10, 11, and 12 at some level. And, I, and it goes like this now. Dear God, please help me love my wife in such a way that she will know that you exist. You see, our big book says that I'm in the world to play the role that he assigns. And when I think about what roles God has given me, what roles has he assigned to me? First is husband. The next is father. The next is grandfather. I'm going to close with this. I, I was at uh, um, my granddaughter, Grace. She's uh, eight years old. She plays soccer. Oh, well, that's not true. She's on a soccer team, and they attempt to play soccer, right? I don't know if any of you have ever been to an eight-year-old soccer game. It is the greatest thing ever. And i got to tell you, no matter how, it was like the worst possible soccer game in the history of soccer. It was six kids just doing this, just kicking a ball, just running everywhere. It's, nope. It was terrible. They broke all the rules. But I was mesmerized. I could not take my eyes off my eight-year-old granddaughter. Oh my gosh, oh my, oh my, oh my, oh my God. See, I think that's us. We're running around this game called life, breaking all the rules. And our dad is mesmerized at us. You see, God loves me not because of who I am, but because of who he is. He reached into the gutter and he pulled me out. I don't know all the purposes of why. I, I can't talk about that. I don't know. But I know there's at least a couple, and the first one is to maybe be an example that he is a God who gives new life to people. The second is, is that this program works, and my job is to go tell people that. It doesn't matter if they listen. My job is to tell them. And then the third thing is to open that book with people and show them. I want to thank you all for having me here tonight. If you've been in a spot where it's just not working out, maybe you've been around a little while and you know all the mottos and all the slogans and everything and it ain't working out, and you think, I better do another four-step. My question would be, did you finish the process the first time? Maybe you wrote a four-step, but you didn't carry it all the way to nine. Maybe it is time to upgrade the fourth. I don't know. But don't start this process of four through nine and stop halfway through and expect the results that only come from finishing the process. God bless you all. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.